Historical materialism is Karl Marx's answer to the idea that there is no law that can explain human history. Like Charles Darwin, who uncovered the theory of evolution, historical materialism is the theory of history. It is not great ideas or personalities that drive human progress, but real material conditions. So please, while you listen, keep in mind that this is a scientific way of thinking. Marx loved science, and this was his contribution to it. Let's go. What makes us human? Now we all know that humans have consciousness, and many people think this is what separates us from animals. But if this is true, Marx believed that this wasn't the whole story. What is the cause of this special human higher consciousness? There must be a reason for it. After all, we are an animal, and so there should be an evolutionary reason for our cognitive ability. Why did we not just develop sharp claws and big pointy teeth? Now, if you think about it, we humans make things to survive. We manipulate our environments, and that is why we need this higher consciousness. We constantly refashion our surroundings to meet our historical needs and desires. We are the only species that produces with this cognitive forethought or imagination. Our highest virtue, our greatest strength is the power of imagination and bringing that in to fruition. Now it developed so we could become more and more efficient at producing things, i.e. making shit. This is what makes us human. This is our version of sharp claws, venom, or lightning fast reactions. Imagine, make, survive, repeat. Now some of you are thinking, well, bees make shit. Yes, but they don't imagine the hive or a new honey recipes and bring that into reality. They produce only in a predetermined way, always making with the same processes. Labor. Now, if you look at primitive human societies, right through to our very own complex civilizations today, the one constant is our need to produce stuff. Culture changes, politics changes, art, ideas, religion. But we always need to produce. We need food, water, shelter, tools, infrastructure, etc. And with producing stuff, there is always the division of labor. No one person knows or can do everything that is needed to be done to support life in that community. In the very earliest societies, hunter and gatherer ones, the cliched division of labor was between hunting and gathering. In industrial societies, the division of labor is so complex and varied that you couldn't fathom all the jobs out there. It's on a planetary scale. And here's the catch. Every society, even today, has never been able to use the division of labor to produce sufficiently so that everyone in society can have enough of both the necessities and the luxuries. Now, this is not an inbuilt feature of the human existence, though. It's not a natural thing that there is not enough to go around to satisfy everyone. But because of this deficit, one section of society will attempt to take a disproportionate share of the material and cultural goods, the wealth, so that they can live a more fulfilling life. Now, the group in society that controls a disproportionate amount of the wealth and usually assumes the power that comes with it can be referred to as a class, a ruling class. Now, a class is simply a group with shared interests. Remember though, this is not because people are inherently evil. No, this is because there is scarcity. Again, not enough of the goodies. So everyone is almost predisposed to want to try and get more of the limited things that are produced. Basically, while there is this thing called scarcity, people will continue to act in their own interests primarily and justifiably. Marx was not judging here. This is scientific. This is why many people today ostensibly think Greed is simply human nature. Human nature, if we go back to the beginning, is to create, not hoard. That is a response only. Now, how we deal with this scarcity is the driving force behind human history. Remember, it is not radical ideas and great people. They are important factors, but it's not the determining force in human history. 
forces of production. Now I'm going to start throwing some heavy Marxist jargon at you, so I apologise in advance. You might have to watch this section a couple of times to get it. The forces of production are how a society at any time in history tries to deal with the problem of scarcity. You do it with two things, technology and labour. Technology being the tools, the land, the resources or the machinery used to produce. These things are then used by slaves, serfs or workers who produce the value everyone survives of. Now the value this group of workers, the working class, produces is appropriated, used, by those who own the means of production, the technology. Typically, that's why they are a ruling class, because they control all the effective value that the whole society feeds on. Now, Marx argued that the less technologically developed the means of production are, for example, if you're using just simple tools to produce, the more workers are needed to be physically enclosed, i.e. you need to own slaves. So then, the more technologically advanced society is, the less you need to keep workers all year round. In industrial societies, like today, you can just hire labour for a short period of time on a contractual basis, and then just fire them when necessary. The productive relations, all the various social relations between people, i.e. the social order, is determined by the development of the forces of production, i.e. how advanced the tech and the labour is at any time, and how everyone interacts with it. These productive relations are the social structure of society, the pecking order, the class divisions. The forces of production and the productive relations give you the mode of production, e.g. ancient mode, feudalism, capitalism, socialism, etc. Importantly, the productive relations in any given mode, or the culture, the politics, the art, the ideas, the institutions and values, the state serves to legitimise the mode of production. For example, all ideology today reinforces capitalism. Now, this is not a conspiracy, this is just a causal matter. Think about it, all the faith we have today in the institution of private property and individualism comes directly from the capitalist mindset. Everyone today believes in the right to own things as free individuals to the exclusion of all others. Being able to control your own property is the basis for the entire free market system of exchange. For most of human history, private property was not an important idea or a basic right for most people. But that doesn't mean then that a given mode of production will last forever just because all thinking and ideas justifies it. No, the ideology doesn't make history. It's the forces of production. As long as the productive relations, the social structure, continues to allow the technology and the labour to produce the most efficiently, then the mode of production will continue. Feudalism lasted as long as it did because it was efficient until capitalism challenged it at its productive centre, at its core. So once production begins to be held back by the mode of production, or as Marxists would say it, it acts as a fetter on production, then you can expect a change, a revolution. Let me explain a little bit more. The problem with the capitalist mode of production. Capitalism is extremely interesting because it's the first mode of production that has continually revolutionised the means of production as its raison d'etre. And it's all thanks to the laws of coercive competition. Because of the profit motive, capitalists continually seek technological advancement to get the edge on their competitors. Technology, in terms of labour saving devices, productive efficiency and scientific breakthroughs are developed for profit and just as significantly overall on the society or the macro level technological advancement expands human productive capacity at an ever increasing rate and so Marx pointed out for the first time in human history we have a situation where the problem of scarcity can be solved Capitalism produces so much shit that we could possibly resolve the age-old problem of there not being enough to go round. It's now a choice. The problem with capitalism, though, is precisely the profit motive and its social relations. They cause crises. Think about it. 
when there is a depression or a slump, it's not because capitalists are not producing as effectively all of a sudden. They have the exact same ability and capacity to produce the same amount of goods and services. It's just that people can't afford to buy them or there isn't enough capital to go around to stimulate the process. This is a crisis of under consumption. Under consumption. Capitalism's social relations are founded on there being a disproportionate distribution of wealth and incomes. You need money to consume. The inherent inequality of capitalism inhibits capital circulation. People don't have enough money to buy all the shit produced to keep the system going. The social relations of capitalism are inhibiting production. We have the ability to produce for more people, but this is being held back where the profitability doesn't stack up. Capitalism has offered us the technical solution to the problem of scarcity, but it can't do anything about it because of the productive relations. The working classes or the majority of consumers cannot always pay for the commodities produced and this causes massive inefficiencies and waste across the system. But remember, this is a science. History does not pose a problem you cannot fix. And so, a revolution in the forces of production and or the social relations is possible. Many people think that this could be just around the corner, especially the likes of Marx and Lenin. They believed a workers' revolution was imperative and imminent. But capitalism is very adaptive. It finds ways to continue to allow what is produced to be consumed. Remember, the mode of production will only revolutionize once the productive relations are obviously holding back the forces of production from dealing with the scarcity problem. Capitalism, over the last 50 years, has unpegged the dollar from the gold standard, unleashed the credit system, digitized money, and uses central banks to print currency by the trillions to keep the system afloat and consumption going. But there will be a point in time when the capitalist mode won't be able to distribute what it produces effectively enough to justify itself. Crises will increase and forces will need to change. I hope, as Marx did, this will mean a workers' revolution. It would be nice to have the people that create the value that society lives off decide how it is managed. Again though, I warn, capitalism is very adaptive. And there are many tricks in capital's playbook, not just economic ones like monetary policy, to keep itself alive. It is our job to attack capitalism at its core to revolutionize ourselves and the mode of production. Remember, I am, you are, we are a mystery.